We are here today for Race is the Place is the Space uh, with Dr. Brenda Dixon Gaschild. I'll read a little bit about the folks that we have here. Uh, we have B. Shane Frederick uh, on uh, piano and voice uh, accompanying Dr. Gaschild. Uh, B. Shane Frederick is a pianist, vocalist, arranger, and musical director with performances spanning two decades. He has been featured at such venues as the historic Minton's in Harlem, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Kimmel Center for the Performing Arts, the Barnes Foundation, a really long list, the John Coltrane Jazz Festival, Center City Jazz Festival, Lancaster Avenue Jazz and Arts Festival, um, and of course here at the African American Museum. He's been cited by the Broad Street Review as one of the region's busiest and best jazz singers. Uh, B. Shane has been appointed one to watch in the shining light in All About Jazz. He has a, a debut album, which is out called Lovesome, and I believe he just also has a Christmas project that released too. So please learn more about B. Shane Frederick. Um, so, Dr. Brenda Dixon Gottschild, having performed with the Mary uh, Anthony Dance Theater and the Joseph Chaikin Open Theater in her 20s, Harlem native Brenda Dixon Gottschild is the author of four, book, four independent books and one co-author textbooks. I will tell you that her book, The Black, uh, the Black Dancing Body, is in our gift shop today. And if you pick up a copy, Dr. Brenda is happy to sign one for you. Um, a self-described anti-racist cultural worker utilizing performance as her medium. She's a freelance writer, consultant, performer, lecturer, and professor emerita of dance studies at Temple University. Nationwide and abroad, she performs self-created solos and collaborates with her, with her husband, uh, choreographer, dancer, Helmut Gottschild, who is here in the room somewhere. I don't see Helmut. Hey, Helmut. <laughs> um, Helmut Gottschild in a genre they develop entitled Movement Theater Discourse. Uh, please welcome Dr. Brenda Dixon Gottschild. Race is the place, is the space. was a puppy. <laughs> Ain't seen you since the cat had kitties. Oh. I'm so glad. I is just so glad to be here. And I want you to know that it's me, Jemima, and I is back in town. Hot day. And I done brought some fixings for you children. None of them happy fine pancakes, and none of them wonderful, wonderful, wonderful flapjacks. No, Lord, Lord, I done brought y'all children something else. Oh, uh oh. Wait. Hold on now. Is y'all all right? Oh, is y'all going to be stuck up? Hinkedy? Dickedy? Y'all better not be like that. We's all kin here, children. And I done brung something for you from my husband, your uncle. Your uncle. Uncle Tom? No. My husband's uncle, Remus. Remus is my husband and I's his missus. And we done got wed all legal like yes sir, we bought. We done jumped the room. So I done brought some of Remus's story for you, children. So you can act 
actually, actually eat these words and feed y'all's brains. Mm. <laughs> Hot day. So let's see. Let's see now. What old Reem, that's what I like to call it. Reem, let's see what old Reem done conjured up for us. But first, gotta get my cheetahs out. Ain't this cute? See the modern. Let's see now. I knows how to read. Remus done learnt me that. No. Sit Zen. Differentiation. Twigs to do. All right. <coughs> this ain't gin. <laughs> is y'all ready? Yes. All right. I is too. Watching the black tarred street being swallowed by speed. He tells you his dean is making him hire a person of color when there are so many great writers out there. Maybe this is an experiment and you are being tested or retroactively insulted or you have done something that communicates this is an okay conversation to be having. Why do you feel comfortable saying this to me? You wish the light would turn red and a police siren would go, oh, 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 and you could slam on the brakes, slam into the car ahead of you, fly forward so quickly both your faces would suddenly be exposed to the wind. As usual, you drive straight through the moment with the expected backing off of what was previously said. It is not only that confrontation is headache producing, it is also that you have a destination that doesn't include acting like this moment isn't inhabitable, hasn't happened before, and the before isn't part of the now 
as the night darkens and the time shortens between where we are and where we are going. Where we are and where we are going. When you arrive in your driveway and turn off the car, you remain behind the wheel another 10 minutes. You fear the night is being locked in and coded on a cellular level and you want time, time to function as a power wash. Sitting there, staring at the garage door, you are reminded that a friend once told you there exists the medical term John Henryism for people exposed to stresses stemming from racism. They achieve themselves to death, trying to dodge the buildup of erasure. Sherman James, the researcher who came up with the term, claimed the physiological costs were high. You hope by sitting in silence, you are bucking the trend. John Henry Howe, he could hammer, he could whistle, he could sing. He went down to the mountain early morning just to hear his hammering, Lord, Lord, just to hear his hammering. When John Henry was a little boy, sitting on his daddy's knee, just he picked up steel, said the hammer be the death of me, Lord, Lord. Hammer be the death of me, Lord, Lord. Hammer be the death of me. Hammer be the death of me. Hammer's gonna be the death of me. And he died. And he died. And he died. And he died with a hammer. Because of your elite status from a year's worth of travel, you've already settled into your window seat on United Airlines when the girl and her mother arrive at your row. The girl. The girl. The girl looking over at you tells her mother, these are our seats, but, 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 this is not what I expected. The mother's response is barely audible. I see. She says, I'll sit in the middle. When the stranger asks, why do you care? You just stand there staring at him. He has just referred to the boisterous teenagers in Starbucks as niggers. 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 Hey, I'm standing right here, you respond. Not necessarily expecting him to turn to you. He's holding the lidded paper cup in one hand and a small paper bag in the other. They're just being kids. Come on, no need to go all KKK on them, you say. 
Now there you go. There I go, there I go. He says. He says. He says. The people around you have turned away from their screens. The teenagers are on pause. There I go. There I go. There I go, you ask. There I go. There I go. I go. There 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 I go. Air. 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 Lord knows, getting hot in here. <laughs> subway. You feel your own body wince. He's okay, but the son of a bitch, the son of a bitch, the son of a biatch, the son of a bitch, stranger's arm and told him to apologize. I told him to look at the boy and apologize. Yes, and you want it to stop. You want the child pushed to the ground to be seen, to be helped to his feet, to be brushed off by the person that did not see him has never seen him, has perhaps never seen anyone who is not a reflection of himself. The beautiful thing is that a group of men began to stand behind me like a fleet of bodyguards. entrance she uses for patients. You walk down a path bordered on both sides with deer grass and rosemary to the gate, which turns out to be locked. At the front door, the bell is a small round disc that you press firmly. When the door finally opens, the woman standing there yells at the top of her lungs, get away from my house, what are you doing in my yard? It's as if a wounded Doberman Pinscher or a German Shepherd has gained the power of speech. And though you back up a few steps, you manage to tell her you have an appointment. You 
have an appointment, she spits out. Then she pauses. Everything pauses. She, oh, she says, oh, you, she has everything pauses on, oh, she says, followed by, oh, oh, yes, she pauses, oh, yes, oh, that, oh, that is oh, right, oh, ah, oh, ah, I am sorry. I am sorry. I am so, so sorry. I am so sore. This world is coming to What? Lord. What? What? What does a victorious or defeated black woman's body in a historically white space look like? of Venus Williams brought to mind Zora Neale Hurston's quote, I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. The sense that no amount of visibility will alter the ways in which one is perceived. Yes. And the body, the body, the body holds memory. The physical carriage hauls more than its weight. The body is the threshold across which each objectionable call passes into consciousness. And here's a wonderful artwork reproduced here by Glenn Legon, riffing on Zora Neale Hurston's line, I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. Indeed, every look, every comment, every bad call blossoms out of history through her into you. 
To understand is to see Serena as hemmed in as any other black body thrown against our American background. Give me some travel in <laughs> conversation, you tell the manager you are speaking with that you will come by his office to sign the form. When you arrive and announce yourself, he blurts out, I didn't mean that. I didn't know. Didn't know. Didn't mean. Didn't know. Didn't mean, didn't know, didn't mean, didn't know, didn't mean, didn't know. Allowed, you say. Allowed. 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 Allowed? Allowed? You didn't mean to say that aloud, you say. Your transaction goes swiftly after that. Okay, it is now time. It's time to remove the last vestiges of Aunt Jemima. Time to say goodbye to all those stereotypes. And it's so easy for us to play them, you know? They are like locked into the American imaginary, locked into our DNA. It's time to get rid of them. Time to say goodbye to all the Beulahs, the Mammies, Time to say goodbye to all the roles played by the great and wonderful actors like Butterfly McQueen and Hattie McDaniel. And even more recent things, the roles played by Octavia Spencer and Viola Davis in The Help. You know, help us, Hollywood. Goodbye to the many, many maids roles played on stage screen and TV by a wonderful New York City actor, Rosetta Lenoir. And some of the older ones of you maybe remember her name. Anyway, in her incredibly long and productive career as an actor and producer, she played so many maids roles that a friend of mine who uh, attended NYU with me, we were both working on our dissertations, uh, my dear friend Linda Kerr Norflet's dissertation was titled and focused on, and I quote, the maid's roles of Rosetta Lenoir. Enough. Enough of that. Goodbye. <laughs> oh. Meanwhile, In the present, we get rid of Jemima's white shirt as well. And you know, she was neat and clean. She was no slump. But this is the present. The present and the future to come. Excuse me while I fiddle with this.
long ago, you are in a room where someone asks the philosopher Judith Butler, what makes language hurtful? You can feel everybody lean in. Our very being exposes us to the address of another, she says. We suffer from the condition of being addressable. Our emotional openness, she adds, is carried by our addressability. Language navigates this. For so long, you thought the ambition of racist language was to denigrate and erase you as a person. After considering Butler's remarks, you begin to understand yourself as rendered hyper-visible in the face of such language acts. Language that feels hurtful is intended to exploit all the ways that you are present. Your alertness, your openness, your desire to engage, your desire to actually be present in your presence. You're looking up, you're talking back, and as insane as it seems in your saying, please, please, please. Police! Please? 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 white bodies, red bodies, blue bodies, yellow bodies, purple bodies, pink bodies, green bodies, 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 everybody's bodies, bodies, my body, your body, anybody, everybody, nobody, everybody, anybody, nobody, everybody, body. Body, everybody, body, anybody want a body? Anybody want to buy 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 a black body? I find it curious about the mythology that we've grown up with the idea of the black body versus the white body, and yeah, there is a difference between being black and being white. And I wonder how much of that has to do with the moving. Physical experience is extremely political, and I've seen this culturally. Even to say black dance there is a choice being made there in reference to something else. Ralph Lemon. And in case you don't know, he's a fairly incredible, internationally known dancer, choreographer, performer, thinker. A black dance is any dance that a person who is black happens to make. There was a time when I never wanted to be called a black company or a black choreographer. I've spent a life trying not to look at it that way. Bill T. Jones. And I know you all know him. So 
somebody. Ms. Fowler. <laughs> A dance that is made by, performed by, black dance is a dance that is made by, performed by a black person or a white person doing a black person's dancing or choreography. I think I did black dance when I did Bill T. Jones's dance. It's not just about who's making it, if they're black or who's white, or who's doing it if they're black, I think it goes deeper than that. I think Twyla Tharp made black dance. Sean Curran. I do not believe there is such a phenomenon as black or white dance, or even a black or white dancing body. They are cultural milestones, not racial markers. The black dancing body, a fiction based on reality, a fact based upon illusion. Brenda Dixon Gottschild. Wynton Marsalis characterized the jazz as existence music. It doesn't take you out of the world, it puts you in the world. It makes you deal with it. Likewise, says Brenda Dixon Gottschild, the black dancing body is the existential body. Things may have changed <clears throat> since his undergraduate days in the dance department at State University of New York at Purchase. However, here's what Doug Elkins recalls about the general attitude of the dance faculty in the early 1980s towards his dance preferences. And I'm quoting. When we were talking about white dance identity, it used to be presented like, this is right. The other things are interesting games and experiments, but if you really want to dance, they are apparitions. They are bastardizations of the real thing. I remember constantly being told by the ballet teachers, this is ballet. This has a 400 year history. It is right. Mel Wong was my mentor and a person for me to talk with. They're telling me I should stop break dancing so I can focus on becoming a real dancer. And he said, you are a real dancer. Don't let someone fool you by thinking they're going to make you real. That was helpful. There's an Yvonne Rayner quote, and I'm paraphrasing it. One of the hardest things to learn to ignore is other people's explanations of who you are. One of the hardest things to ignore is other people's explanations of who you are. Who you are, where you are, how you are, why you are. Here you are. Here we are. We are here, standing outside the conference room unseen by the two men waiting for the others to arrive. You hear one say to the other that being around black people is like watching a foreign film without translation. Being around black people is like watching a foreign film without translation. Being around black people 
people. It's like watching a foreign film without translation. Being around black people, it's like watching a foreign film without translation. Because you will spend the next two hours around the round table that makes conversing easier, you consider waiting a few minutes before entering the room. A friend tells you, you have to learn not to absorb the world. She says sometimes she can hear her own voice saying silently to whomever, you are saying this thing and I'm not going to accept it. Your friend refuses to carry what does not belong to her. You take in things you don't want all the time. The second you hear or see some ordinary movement, all of its intended targets, all the meanings behind the retreating seconds as far as you are able to see, come into focus. Hold on, did you just hear? Did you just see? Did you just do? Did you, did you, did you see? Did you, did you see that? Did you, did you do that? Did you, did, you, did you see that? Did you see that? Then the voice in your head silently tells you to take your foot off your throat because just getting along shouldn't be an ambition. Words, words, words work as release. Well-oiled doors opening and closing between intention, gesture, a pulse in the neck, the shiftiness of the hands, an unconscious blink, conversations you have had with your eyes. translate into everything and nothing. What will be needed, what goes unfelt, unsaid, what has been duplicated, redacted here, redacted there, altered to hide or disguise, words encoding the bodies they cover. And despite everything, the body, the body, the body remains. Occasionally, it is interesting to think about the outburst if you would just cry out. To know what that sounds like is worth noting. drugstore. It's finally your turn, and then it's not, as he walks in front of you, puts his things on the counter. The cashier says, sir, sh she was next. When he turns to you, he is truly surprised. Oh my God, I didn't see you there. You must be in a hurry. No, no, I, I, I really didn't see you. He says, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see you. You didn't. I didn't see you. Didn't. I didn't. I, I you didn't see me. I didn't see you. I didn't see you. I didn't see you. I didn't 
Si, si, si you, I didn't see you, I didn't see you, I didn't see you, I didn't see. Understanding America for the non-American black. What do wasps aspire to? Professor Hunk has a visiting professor colleague, a Jewish guy with a thick accent from the kind of European country where most people drink a glass of anti-Semitism at breakfast. So, Professor Hunk was talking about civil rights, and the Jewish guy says, The blacks have not suffered like the Jews. Professor Hunk replies, Come on, is this the oppression Olympics? Jewish guy didn't know this, but oppression Olympics is what smart, liberal Americans say to make you feel stupid and to make you shut, shut up. But there is an oppression Olympics going on. American racial minorities, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and Jews all get shit from white folks. Different kinds of shit, but shizit, shit, shit still. Each secretly believes that it gets the worst shizit. So no, there is no united league of the oppressed. However, all the others think they're better than blacks because, well, they're not black. <laughs> Take Lily, for example, the coffee-skinned, black-haired, and Spanish-speaking woman who cleaned my aunt's house in New England. She had great hauteur. She was disrespectful, clean, poorly, made demands. Before she finally fired her, my aunt said, stupid woman, she thinks she's white. So, whiteness is the thing to aspire to? Not everyone does, of course, and please, commentators, don't state the obvious. But many minorities have a conflicted longing for wasp whiteness or more accurately, for the privileges of wasp whiteness. They probably don't really like pale skin, but they certainly like walking into a store without some security dude following them. Hating your goy and eating one too, as the great Philip Roth put it. So everyone in America aspires to be wasps, then what do wasps aspire to? Does anybody know? That's a rhetorical question. <clears throat> to my fellow non-American blacks, in America, you are black, baby. I'm not black. Dear non-American black, when you make the choice to come to America, you become black. Stop arguing. Stop saying, I'm Jamaican or I'm Ghanaian. America doesn't care. So what if you weren't black in your country? You're in America now. We all have our moments of initiation into the society of former Negroes. Mine was in a class in undergrad when I was asked to give the black perspective, only I had no idea what that was, so I just made something up. And admit it, you say, I'm not black, <laughs> only because you know black is at the bottom of America's race ladder. 
and you want none of that. Don't deny now. <laughs> what if being black had all the privileges of being white? Would you still say, don't call me black, I'm from Trinidad? I didn't think so. So you are black, baby. And here is the deal with becoming black. If you are in an Ivy League school and a young Republican tells you that you got in only because of affirmative action, do not whip out your perfect grades from high school. Instead, gently point out that the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action are white women. If you're telling a non-black person about something racist that happened to you, make sure that you are not bitter. Don't complain. Be forgiving. If possible, make it funny. <laughs> <laughs> make it funny. Make it funny. <laughs> 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 Make it funny. Most of all, do not be angry. Black people are not supposed to be angry about racism. Otherwise, you get no sympathy. This applies only for white liberals, by the way. Don't even bother telling a white conservative about anything racist that happened to you, because the conservative will tell you that you are the real racist and your mouth will hang open in confusion. There is, in much of America, a stealthy little notion lying in the hearts of many that white people earned their place at jobs and school while black people got in because they were black. But in fact, since the beginning of America, white people have been getting jobs because they are white. Many whites with the same qualifications but Negro skin would not have the jobs they have. But don't ever say this publicly. Let your white ally friend say it. If you make the mistake of saying this, you will be accused of a curiosity called playing the race card. Nobody quite knows what this means. So what's the deal? So what is the deal? What's the deal? They tell us race is an invention, that there is more genetic variation between two black people than there is between a black person and a white person. They tell us black people have a worse kind of breast cancer and get more fibroids, and white folk get cystic fibrosis and osteoporosis. So, what's the deal, doctors in the house? What's the deal? Is race an invention or not? Is race an invention or not? Is race an invention or not? Thank you. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's not over. It's not over. Now comes your part. Can you sit for a little bit? OK, fine. So uh, I've put together this little concoction. This, um, and I thank Shane so much for 
helping me out with this. And um, basically as a way to challenge you and to get us thinking and talking about what we are living and this particular moment in time. Uh, and as, a, you know, as uh, James announced, this is a part of like the movement theater discourse uh, uh, genre that Helmut, my husband and I, have, have uh, put together. So um, I would like for us to have a, a few moments to talk, but uh, not in the traditional Q&A or talk back. Uh, let me quote Bill T. Jones. He said something wonderful. He said that art asks us to look at ourselves and watch ourselves watching it. So in other words, he's suggesting that performance is a verb, a reflexive verb that points back to you. I, I would like if we could let these thoughts lead us into a different kind of post-performance language so that we don't talk the performance away by you know, asking me theoretical or intellectual questions, but I would like for you to be able to experience more deeply what I have shared, what Shane and I have shared with you. Uh, so I'm going to ask if you would just take a few seconds to pull an image or a key moment uh, from the performance, from what either one of us did. If you can reflect on that image for a moment and just let that guide you into words. What did you see? Uh, how does it resonate with your own experience? Where does it take you? Where did it touch you? Your heart, your mind, your gut? Where do you reside? the spectrum of what we've presented. And anybody can begin. Yes, and please, since we're such a small group, what's your name? Uh, my name is Shane Law. David, hi. Yes. people have experienced similar or any other uh, image or thought that comes to mind. But yeah, just from please, just from please. Yeah. Do I have to please you? Yes. Hello, good afternoon. Yes, and I want your name. My name's Dolly. Hi, Marshall. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Where have I heard that before? <laughs> I enjoyed um, your uh, presentation immensely. Um, so the moment that resonated with me most um, was when you gave an example when you were saying, you don't see me. Oh, uh -huh. so I just kind of thought of an example of, you know, being in a store, like a drugstore, a supermarket, and I think we've all experienced that. And that's what kind of conjured in my mind immediately. And as 
I evolve in my womanhood. I don't let those types of things bother me like they used to. Mm. But it did used to. So when at that moment when you were reenacting it, yes. yeah, I felt a feeling when it used to affect me. Okay. okay. Very much. Yes. Like you didn't see me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You didn't see me. Yes. And it's not coming from a place of ego or arrogance, right. but right. you did yes. not see me. me. Right. And yes. I'm standing here before you. So what gives you the right mm -hmm. to say I'm invisible? Yes. Or yes. that I don't matter? Because I, I, I would always think deeper with that. It's not just someone flooding in line or cutting in line, yeah. they're in a hurry to buy a pack of cigarettes or whatever. I always felt that it was a deeper root issue to that. Exactly. Because like, I'm a woman. Yeah. Black woman. Exactly. You know, yeah. so yeah. that that was very mm -hmm. that really touched me. Thanks, Thanks Dolly. Dolly. And, and I think, you know, you know just, just to build on a couple, couple really, really important things that Dolly, Dolly said, as, as a, you know, get, everybody's really getting get to the nitty gritty so far. So far. <laughs> uh, that uh, it, it seems, seems like, like either you are too, too visible or you're too, too invisible. Yes. So yes. you can be going in the yes. store, you know, and uh, everybody's watching you. Or nobody, nobody in this whole thing, thing David, about, about are you dressed right? right? You know, like you know, white people don't have to think about what they're wearing. You know, it's it's like not the issue, right? And and you know, we can be. I was older lady and stuff. I get the same shit. You know, yeah. And and certainly though, the sense that Dolly, you say that it, it doesn't bother you as much anymore. That's like that's a real leap. That's a real leap because I feel that I want to not be bothered by it, but you know, it's their problem, but they're laying it on you. And that all the things that, that one has to do in order to adjust to not feel it, you know, it's, um, but that's why we have, you know, groups like this so we can come together and kind of feel each other's strengths. Um, uh, a, a black meditator in the uh, whole um, insight and Shambhala sense, he, t he was talking about uh, using the power of hurt to get beyond your suffering. And he talked about uh, in this uh, message, he was talking about the importance of what you call in the, the Buddhist community, Sangha, which is a community. So, so like, like the, the, the you know, know place like, like this where you can speak the hurt to, to, to get, get to, to use the suffering to get you beyond it. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Dolly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Jennifer. Jennifer, Jennifer, hello. I had it, oh, so many things resonated with me, so right now it's like my heart. Mm -hmm. <gasps> 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, like, Right, right. Thank you. And by the way, you know, I am just the interpreter. These books are solid gold. Okay. Mine is pretty good too. The Black Dancing Body is pretty good. But these are what an interesting and wonderful novel. But it's it's based on so much else. And all oh, these uh, incredible their their poem essays. You know, which, which is, is basically, basically what I was depending on. Such incredible, incredible stuff. stuff. Also, also, I mean, I mean even, even though it's, it's largely written for four white, white people by a white, white woman, woman. Robin, Robin D'Angelo's book, White, white Fragility. Fragility. Have any people heard of that? Or see? Okay, excellent, excellent book. And again, it helps me to have these things. Again, to know that I have a community out there that's holding me, you know. Yes. yes, and then and you. you. Hi. Hi, I'm Heidi from Hi. 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 Yeah. Hi. Hi.
company. Um, and it's just, I feel like, like sometimes it's hard to know, can I claim this as my own? You know, is it black dance because I'm doing it, or is it just me appropriating something? Um, this has been a long fight, the that black ballerina fight. And um, we don't have it in the bookstore downstairs, but the, the last book I wrote was uh, called Joe Myers Brown and the Audacious Hope of the Black Ballerina, right? Uh, an American, uh, a biohistory of American culture. And uh, Joe Myers Brown has like upped the ante with this fight. And of course, there are always, there's always one of us somewhere. But this, there's this history of, you know, black people doing ballet and playing European orchestral music, you know, for, since day one, since America became America. You know, but again, still, you go to the Philadelphia Orchestra and as much, and my dear friend Lou is there, who takes me to the orchestra frequently, and I always say, why is it only that one black? Or two, it's actually two or three, I think, out of like 90, you know. So the issues around all this are, are very real, but um, it, it's yours. It does belong to you. And it's just so annoying that you've been ever made to feel it didn't, you know. Uh, and some of us are really lyrical dancers, especially if that's, you train to be a ballerina. It doesn't have to do with ethnicity, and certainly not with race. It's about training, that's all. You know, there are people doing African dance in Japan. You know, Chuck Davis told me when I interviewed him, Baba Chuck, bless his soul, years ago, uh, when I was interviewing him for the Black Dancing Body book, and it's probably in there, said, people are doing African dance everywhere. So then please, please, you know, let us realize that we own ballet as much as they own our uh, properties. I mean, you can't hold, and that's the thing, you can't hold on to cultural properties, you know. Yeah. But it's yours. And if you're going to be in Philadelphia in January, the International Association, which I'm always involved with, the International Association of Blacks in Dance is having their annual conference in Philadelphia this year. And uh, you can always see some ballet in the concerts, and it's January 14th to the 19th. And dear, dear Joan Myers Brown did this wonderful thing because the white ballet companies were constantly saying, we can't find black dancers. Every year now at this International Association of Blacks and Dance Conference, there is a ballet audition for black males, and the main thing is for black females. And all of the major white companies are invited to send a representative so that they can choose somebody from the auditions. Now, of course, many um, of the white companies don't even bother to come, but many do. So again, like everything that has happened for us in this nation that we helped to build, like John Henry, you know, everyone, everything that is here is ours as much as anybody else's. So don't lose courage. Go back to your classes. <laughs> yes. How are you doing, everyone? Hi. My name is Chase Carey. Uh, the one comment you made regarding the, the way uh, black films are perceived as a foreign film without needing translation. That was uh, real powerful for me because um, one thing, that I, I like anime, so like ah. um, Japanese cartoons. Yes. And people always comment, oh, those are cartoons, I don't like them. Mm -hmm. But from my perspective of uh, looking at that, or at that type of art, is that there's all kinds of genres within that itself. Uh -huh. like horror, love, and doing action stuff. Sure. Same thing with like, when I think of like Bollywood. Yes. And yeah. everything, there's all types of genres within that. Right. So it's interesting how we look at, when I look at just traditional American movies, is this, that's normal. And then when we go to a black film, now it has that sub-genre, which is really intriguing. Yes, yes, yes. You yeah. need to be like, remove the word it originated from. Yes. And focus on the art itself. Yes, yeah. yeah. 
And it's so interesting because it's all, as you were pointing out, it's all about your perspective. How are you looking at it? You know, where are you looking at it from? This was such a quiet audience. <laughs> oh, yes, right. My name's Will. Will, hi. Um, going back to when you talk about healing, that um. resonated with me because it's as early as yesterday when I was in a place where there was, it was an environment. Um, in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it was crazy all life. Mm -hmm. And I was there, my glass in front of me, and then a white woman literally stood almost on top of me to where first I thought perhaps you just, and I'm not saying she backed into me, she walked around and stood almost on top of me in front of my glass. Oh, stop. Wow. And so I swayed <laughs> to see if she could feel me. She couldn't feel me. And in the moment, I was angry. My friend standing next to me looked bewildered, mm -hmm. and then at the same time, she looked like kid. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 so I tapped her, and I, um, and instead of addressing what the issue was, I first wanted to know how they were doing. Mm -hmm. How so? How is the wine? I know she had some things, and they went on to talk about how wonderful their life was. <laughs> and and then as I listened to her, I could hear that she was not aware of anything. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. She uh -huh. was completely okay. oblivious to everything. Interesting. Disconnected. I, I thought I was talking to a child in a woman's closet. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and then I felt sad for her, mm -hmm. and I no longer wanted to check her. Mm -hmm. But when I heard you talking about that, mm -hmm. as you first started, I thought about. Right, of course, yeah. Thank you, and that's so important. I mean, see, Will, I do think that everything has anesthetized me. I do feel because we've lived in this thing for so long, as I said about the um, Jemima stereotypes. It's like a tattoo on the American DNA, on the American imaginary, blacks or whites. I, you know, obviously you, you saw that she, uh, it was, her problem. You saw that it was her problem, you know. Uh, on the other hand, she then has interrupted your space. Also, step in, and that I hate when people get really close on your, your kinosphere, when they enter that and step right on, the, on you. And I hope you don't mind that I touched your knee. <laughs> but uh, that um, even though you know that it's her problem, Still, she has invaded your public privacy, in a sense. So you have every right to, indeed, react. Uh, and of course, it's, it's great, and I feel like it's wonderful. And people can uh, chime in, you know, it's not just uh, me talking to people. I'd like to know what other people felt about any of these things that were said. And when, let's just open it, yes, you speak, and then let's open it to conversation. You don't have to address me for maybe five, 10 more minutes. What's your name? Irene. Okay. Um, I actually liked what she said and how that kind of interaction went, because I think it goes back, kind of back to that question in the performance of like, what do walk, like, what are wasps looking for? <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's like a vacuum, like, I don't know, it, it kind of put that in conversation with that. So I think that was like an interesting connection where it's like, when you start to engage, mm -hmm. there's this voice there that hmm. maybe aren't looking for it, <laughs> no, you know more than you yeah. think. Yeah. 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 Well, to, to expand on that, um, one thing I started doing real, real recently is like I changed my meditation style to be more universal focused hmm. in terms of like a us, like we're all one thing. Hmm. So like if I hurt you, I'm penetrating myself yes. kind of concept. Yes. And um, it's really a weird feeling when you think in the world that way. But like kind of your experience kind of echoes that. Yes. But, it seems it's interesting that our natural behavior is like okay, something was heard was the issue, then it came in my space. Mm -hmm. But how how can we look at it as like this is our issue that we need to fix? Like looking to like America, mm -hmm. like how do we not focus on like 
us versus them. Yeah. So we need to be better. Yes, I agree. And I think it's all about not either or, because there, you know, I feel like we as African Americans, as people in the Americas, uh, and of course we can say the same thing for Latino Americans, also to remember that the Chinese also were the ones who built the railroad, you know, and I know when I was growing up in Harlem, like, we all said, oh, take your laundry to the Chinamen. And they were slaving in these little, every block had a place where, you know, you could smell these steam because they were washing and ironing the, the chicken. So all of us have this. The only, the only thing is, though, it bothers me that we have to be the ones with compassion for, for exactly. the other, you know. And of course, we don't want that. And so it's a real uh, both and. You know, because we don't want to lose our compassion as who we are. Uh, and um, you don't want, so then it's wonderful that you realize she's that way with everybody. It didn't have necessarily, not necessarily, to do with you as a black man, you know. But, you know, why me? Why my compassion, you know? Why, Lord? <laughs> Any other thoughts or, yeah, because now I'm so glad for those, and I always am, am very grateful for the people who come to anything that I do. I mean, I always wish that there were more, you know, but I, I don't need more. I, I just need who managed to come today. And I hope also that for each of you, there was some need that was fulfilled with being here. And just uh, to know that this particular group of like, like 30 people or whatever, we're never going to have this particular coming together ever again, these particular people. So if there's anything that you would like to leave in this space for us to share, now is the time. We have about five minutes at most. Dr. Godshield. This is my brother. I know he would say something. <laughs> I would, I would, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to, to get along, go along to get along anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's been a problem because uh, I find that uh, anger is good for me when, when something <laughs> happens and I let it out and it's just like taking a good you know what I mean? <laughs> so what I'm saying is, is uh, <laughs> I can't let all this build yeah. within me. Yeah, you know, right. Because if I do, I'm carrying this home to my loved ones. Right. Um, and, and I'm going to throw it on them. So exactly. Yeah. So just coming here today from New York, we're in one of the little restaurants, and uh, we're ordering. And this guy says, uh, oh, you gave me this with strawberry on it. And he just reached around across me. Mm. I say, excuse me. <laughs> you know? I mean, like, here I am, y'all. Yes. And yeah. I don't want, and matter of fact, I was, was coming from the doctor after being diagnosed with, with this heart thing. And this guy walks in front of the car. And I try to, you know, take the wrinkles out of his clothes <laughs> with the car. George. And then he pops my mirror back. So I go over and get out the car. I said, what is wrong with you, you know? So we call each other savages and blah, 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 blah. And I could hardly agree. I'm about to have a heart attack out there. Yeah. But the yeah. anger, the all anger. this has to be something. And I mean to carry all this weight yes. is not fair. Yeah. You know, yeah. I belong to Anonymous Fellowship. And I tell them, I said, I'm not here to follow all these steps and rules and regulations and all. I said, I didn't come in here to be tamed. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. My experience in life, when I came to New York at four years old, I had to ride in a baggage car until I got to Washington, D.C. Yeah. Yeah. That was a fa and you were in mother's arms. Right, so, right. You know, this is... We and moved to from, from Virginia still, to Harlem when I was eight months yeah, old. Yeah, and this still lingers with me. I remember the baggage. No one else in the family remembers it. No. But I remember us being shut away in a baggage car mm -hmm. until we got to Washington. Right, where the train There must have been some reason for that. Yeah. You know, and now I find out 
how ignorant the world is yes. that we live in. <laughs> right. you know, right. It's not me, because I used to look at myself and say, why did God make me black? Because everything is against me. Yeah. Yeah. But then I yeah. find out that it's not me. You know, right. it's the ignorance that other people carry, right. and the, right. and the in, uh, what they have stamped on us. Mm -hmm. And exactly. some folks, especially older folks, well, we'll just get along. Mm -hmm. You know, uh -uh, that's not what I'm about. I'm not here to go along to get along. Anymore. Okay, I and, and now we will end on this because I have to speak right to my brother and to everybody, which is. Yes, about the angry and, and the anger. But uh, as I have said to George, and as I say to everyone, you must not let it eat you up. I know that you are saying that it's good to get angry, but everything has its boundaries. And, and again, I mean, at times, I feel like you, you know, it's always like finding the mean, finding the mean. It's not, it's not, you are not to be stamped down, but you are not then to get out and, and do the same thing. You, you exactly. can fight, but not do the same yeah. thing. Yeah. So you don't want to jump out of your car and start yelling the same things at him. Sometimes. You know, because then you have sunk to his level. And yeah, even, even right. though, even though, you know, it's his problem, you can't then, you know, you know, this then brings up to me like who's in the White House right now. Ah. And how, how we deal with that cannot be the same way that he is dealing because we see that that's a no exit. So it's like to take on certain, the, the largesse of the hugeness of the anger, George, it then diminishes you as well. I mean, Okay, <laughs> we shouldn't end on this, okay, but thank you always. And I always know when my brother comes to my presentations that he'll always give a, give a word, which yeah. I appreciate, yeah. yes, yes. I do want to thank you for the presentation. And this is Wendy. My name's Wendy. And she is from my uh, meditation group. Yeah. Oh. yeah, I want to thank you for the presentation. It brought out so many different things. When you first came out, you said you had something for all of us. Yes. Oh, that's nice. I hadn't even thought of it like that. I brought something for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Thanks, Wendy. That's true. Thank you. Anything else, or should we call this a wrap? Well, let's just do this. Let's just all stand. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not a bad idea to, to just hold the hand of anybody who's next to you and just kind of feeling a sense of the presence and the energy in the hand that you are holding. The presence and the energy. Yeah, you can even do that. Great. Oh, wow. We got going here. <laughs> okay. Yes, and like that. Lovely. Lovely. And, and uh, again, what has been said in different ways that we are indeed all connected. And we are, you know, the thing is, all of the negative that we've been talk to, talking about, we all carry that too. You know, I like to say we each contain both a Buddha and a Hitler, mm -hmm. okay? And that's the truth, and it's about how you balance it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Love you all, love this group. Thank you. Ashe. Thank you. Thank you.